This podcast is for you. Your co-hosts, Ben Dodge and Eric Huso at Effect Epic Consulting believe that your potential is limitless. Tapping into this potential is how you can affect epic results in your life, relationships, and business. Welcome to the Principles of Epic Growth. Morning. Good morning, my friend. <laughs> how are you, brother? You know, I'm doing pretty okay. It's one of those days where you're just doing pretty okay. You know, sometimes it's okay to be authentic and say it's pretty okay. Yeah, it's pretty okay. Better to say it's pretty okay than to lie and say it's fantastic. Yeah, there's no reason to lie. It's just pretty okay. It's not bad yeah. though. I mean, I'm looking forward to today. There's, you know, it's a big days, you know. So, uh, but yeah, it's just I'm really looking forward to our podcast actually. So, me too. I mean, this is uh, today. We're doing a couple of things. We're just combining into one. We're calling it "Lead with Power." That was your idea. Good idea. Yeah, genius. <laughs> And uh, we're going to share some thoughts about some uh, principles and individuals and how they demonstrated those principles um, because it's one of those things that we feel can really make an impact on, on your life as a listener because it's really changed our lives. Yeah. So that's always fun to get into some of those topics and how they lived and the things they've overcome and so, so forth. So. The very first uh, plane ticket that I bought for myself uh, was on Southwest Airlines. The cattle car. Yeah. That's what people say sometimes. And uh, I, you know, I was a young adult, not married, and uh, needed to go visit some friends uh, up in Utah. And I looked, and and Southwest prices were like half of Delta. And, and <laughs> You're like, half that's of, it? <laughs> you know, back in the day, America West Airlines. And so uh, that was my very first experience buying a plane ticket, Southwest Airlines. And... Uh, today we're going to talk about a few principles of Southwest Airlines because just a couple of days ago their founder and CEO Herb Kelleher passed away, and so in the in the media there's uh, lots of tributes and such to what he did as a leader and as an entrepreneur, and we, you know we won't go into detail and all that. A lot of it's common knowledge. In fact, if you if you were to pick up a business book about you know how to run a successful business likely they're going to cite some case study from Southwest Airlines because you know over the last 45 years they've never had a year where they lost money and in the airline industry that's like crazy right that's a big deal think about all the bankruptcies all the layoffs all the government bailouts that the airline industry's experienced over the last four or five decades and Southwest Airlines has never not turned a profit why why is that? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, a lot of it is, you know, attributed to the leadership of Herb Kelleher and, and a lot of things that he was focused on. So, yeah, just, you know, I don't, I don't know the man. Um, I do fly Southwest Airlines uh, when I can, uh, you know, if they go to where I'm trying to go. Uh, so I'm a big fan of uh, their company, but I don't know the man. I just know what I have read about him. And so... Uh, consider consider that but what what I would say uh, number one about him is how he treated people he he truly loved his people he was a people person and a lot of people celebrate some of his unorthodoxy type ways you know he's frequently seen with a cigarette in his hand and a, and a glass of booze in the other hand and which is kind of unorthodox uh, is it? <laughs> for, <laughs> I mean, if he's a pilot and he's on well, duty. He's not, he's not a pilot. He, yeah. that's, that's the thing is he was a lawyer. He was a lawyer. and oh, some, no. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> he was somebody a lot like you that, uh, you know, was an attorney but didn't necessarily enjoy practicing law. And he had this uh, opportunity that came to him. A uh, buddy came to him and said, hey, let's start our own airline. And he was like, let's do it. And so they raised the seed money and... Southwest Airlines was born doing little commuter flights between the major cities of Texas. And then uh, from there they expanded and now they're the largest domestic carrier in the United States of America. They carry more passengers than any other airline. It is incredible how successful they are. And they also fly internationally now, which mm-hmm. is uh, as of a couple of years, right? They mm-hmm. Some flights into Mexico and uh, a couple of places down there, potentially in South America. And that's that's incredible. I mean, it's a it's a company that continues to grow. What I didn't know, by the way, and I'm impressed by, is is that for 45 years they've never lost money. That is a huge deal. Yeah. And in that industry, in any industry, but in that industry especially, when there was so much going on, and so I love it. I mean, you get two bags that fly for free, right? Yeah. Right. One of the things that I actually um, 
remember uh, recently here in a book called The Power of Moments by Chip and Dan Heath, they highlight um, the intense, like powerful experience that can be manufactured by people um, that can help increase business and other things. And, and they, they go through elements of this. And one of the main elements for them is, is, is ele- elevating, elevating a person's moment will help define that moment in a way where it's more memorable and, and, and so forth. And one of the things that clearly the CEO of Southwest Airlines has allowed to happen and then furthermore has encouraged to happen once they found out how successful it was, was they allow their employees to break the script, to use the words from Power Moments. And that's where, um, uh, quite literally in this case, it's a script. They're, they have to cover certain rules and policies yeah. from the FAA, and it's about seat belts and exits and all you know all the boring stuff that has to happen before you take off. That on every other airline, people have their heads down and they're totally ignoring the flight attendants. That's right. It's so important that the the government feels that every passenger on every airline should listen to it, and so it's it's rehearsed verbatim everywhere. And yet in Southwest, on a Southwest flight, you have a really good chance. It's not always, but I'd say, you know, eight out of 10 chances, probably you're going to get somebody up there cracking jokes mm-hmm. during the FAA spiel. And to, I mean, it's, it's interesting how you say that because on other airlines, they have their head down, not caring. And on Southwest airlines, people are looking forward to that part of the flight yeah. to, to hear the jokes. And inadvertently, they're also hearing the rules and the policies, and it sticks with you so much more. So here's the study that happened that the, these authors in this book, Power Moments, found out. Um, they did a research. There's extensive data, extensive data kept by these industries and, and companies, particularly Southwest Airlines at the top of this industry. And so every time you buy a flight, you know, they've got your information. Essentially, they know how many times you fly per year and, you know, yada, yada. So across, a, across an intensive study, they were able to realize that those people who were regulars, I think, is how they defined them. And you'll have to go back to the book to figure out what, what the criteria was for a regular flyer. But those who were regular flyers um, who flew a certain amount of times per year, pretty much, uh, had a one and a half times increase in buying additional flights if they listen to one of these hilarious spiels during Southwest Airlines. And um, that might sound like a little a little bit, or ha- actually it was, a, it was one half of one flight, actually. So just a, a half of a flight, there was a half of a flight increase for these people. Mm-hmm. But across a year, that translated to, you know, lots of money, like hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and it was traced directly to those who were on flights where there was the, the Comedy Act versus the non-Comedy Act flights. And so clearly this CEO uh, had a hand in all of this, right? And, and was aware of it and approved it and, you know, the board and so forth to the point where that's encouraged now. And, um, and it creates hundreds of millions of revenue or dollars of revenue per year for Southwest Airlines. Yeah. And, and it's, it's uh, to me, that's just fantastic because it really is a horrible thing to have to listen to the stupid FAA rules and regulations. No one cares. And every other airline is so absolutely boring and bland about it. And yet Southwest Airlines encourages all of the funny jokes. And it is literally better than a most Saturday Night Live like routines that you would see on TV, right? Pretty much all Saturday Night Live. It's just, it's just <laughs> awesome how they do it. And it's super authentic and individually unique to the flight attendants, whoever's in charge. There's not a mandate that they have to do that. They're just permitted to do that. Yeah. And most of them do. And it's just awesome. It's funny. And um, I think there's even some training now in some of those kinds of jokes and routines so that people can feel comfortable giving them if you're an employee mm-hmm. of Southwest Airlines. But the point is, is the same amount of money it would take to expand the company enough to buy another two planes, and that's where the book was going, um, is they wanted to minimize downtime. You, you can't eliminate it because weather's one of your biggest, fiercest enemies in the, in the airline industry, as well as every once in a while there's just going to be a mechanical issue and you're, gonna, and you're not going to really know about it until it's there and you've got to fix yep. it. And so they, they wanted to minimize downtime as much as possible, and they wanted two additional planes just kind of always at the ready. Floaters ready to go. A- again, the CEO of Southwest Airlines, you know, great leadership there on that principle to minimize downtime. And in so doing, they realized that through just the jokes, they raised a, you know, enough of their revenue on an annual basis to purchase two additional planes per year without doing any cost. It doesn't cost them a penny to allow their employees to make those jokes. It's fan- fantastic leadership. Yeah, it really is. And for those that think building culture and spending time on people is a sunk cost or it's a lost cost, Southwest Airlines is the first place that you should look to, to look at what 
What can happen to your organization when you care about people, when you grow your people, when you hire for culture, when you hire for fit, you hire for character? They look for a certain kind of flight attendant. They didn't look for the stuffy flight attendant that you know had zero personality. They look for the flight attendant that had the personality, that had right. the, the ability to connect with other human beings. And then they gave them the freedom to be themselves, to be that authentic self and to grow and to and trust them. And you can just you can see what happened. I mean we don't have to we don't yeah, have to awesome. we don't have to tell you to hundreds, trust us, believe hundreds us. Hundreds of millions of dollars per yeah. year. Yeah. I mean that's that's not insignificant. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, I get um, so. So I didn't know he was a, an attorney, by the way. But uh, most of you guys know that that's one of the things that I do. Is I have a couple law firms in town, and um, I I get complimented on my receptionist as of late, uh, which is and I can say that because I don't think she listens to this podcast. I better she better start listening though. I better invite she, her. To. <laughs> as great as she is, she could be an upgrade as a receptionist if she Here, just listens to your podcast. Here's the deal with this. So and, and this is just a personal principle or. Uh, experience on this principle um, I hired her very intentionally without any legal experience she just has never worked in a law firm in fact she interviewed for a different position at my firm and uh, I was so struck with her personality that I created a position for her and moved the other person out and into a different place and moved her into the receptionist position um, because she's just so good at helping people feel welcome and she's warm and she's friendly mm -hmm. and she's she breaks the script every day, right? In a way, um, and I get compliments all the time, and 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 honestly, I could have invested into you know these people that have been around for fifteen or twenty years in the legal industry and have all this you know know how about how office should work and how consultations and calendaring and billing and all of that should work with with a law firm, and it would have saved me a ton of time and energy and training. Um, but that's not what I wanted to create. I wanted a culture where people were happy to be here and happy to be a part of our office and, and happy to pay us money and were, and felt welcomed and not intimidated. And, and, you know, I wanted to basically be everything law firms aren't. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I couldn't, I, so I needed somebody that could create that f with me, with the personality. And so I hired her and, um, it didn't cost money really. It just, it allowed it, what it cost me was time, which I get as money, but it cost me time in allowing her to be herself and to give her the proper tools and how I want a firm to be run. But um, it, it's interesting how she was probably the unlikely candidate ever, you know, and yet she turns out to be probably one of the best receptionists I've ever had. And I get compliments almost, you know, probably three to four times a week from just strangers about how they loved interacting with her up the front. So Yeah, she is amazing. Yeah. So there's another example of when you get the right people in the right positions, the impact that it has on your culture and the results of your organization. And so those of you that are in uh, the talent industry of trying to attract talent to your organization or help other organizations attract talent, uh, too many times you get stuck in the mud of looking for a certain kind of experience, certain kind of education, etc. The irony is you, know, you can look in the tech industry where you know, a lot of the CEOs that uh, are of the, the big tech firms, they did not have the degree necessary to work in certain places and so they didn't get hired. They didn't get promotions into these certain jobs that you have to have this degree and so they left and people like Mark Zuckerberg started Facebook because he wasn't qualified for a promotion. Uh, at another organization and that happens all the time where we get stuck we get this we create this box this mindset that you know to have this job you have to have this degree and you have to have this many years of experience you you look on jobs and you look at the qualifications and it always says this degree this many years experience and you just weed out a lot of potential candidates that really could make a difference in Southwest Airlines they did not hire for experience they did not hire based on your education they hired on the human being. Yeah, they and, hired personality, they hired character. Yeah, and they is this yeah. person teachable? Is this person coachable? Like I can't change this person's DNA, but man, this this person is such an incredible individual. He connects with individuals. I can train him how to fly. I can train him how to be a, an attendant. I can fly, train him on these customer service practices and he has these inherent gifts and talents that connect him with people. And that was what Southwest did. They just had this focused on people and they hired people that uh, 
were just really good at making connections and and you felt it you know even even though the whole cattle car mentality that's frustrating you don't get your ticket you don't you know you don't have your assigned seat you're trying to get there fast so you can get in the a group you're you know as soon as it's 24 hours before the flight you're logging onto your computer to log in to try to get in that a group all those frustrating things yet we still fly southwest airlines and it's the largest carrier in the united states why because once we're on that flight, like the, the experience that they have created for us is such that we come back in spite of those flaws, if you will. So here's, here's I've thought about this, and here's, in my opinion, here's where the leadership fails for people. You know, so this is, so let's listen up, everyone out there. If you've got, if you're an employee somewhere, an employer, it doesn't really matter, you have a small business or you work for somebody, here's where the leadership fail happens. If you mistakenly think that, talent, experience, degrees, things like that, translate into um, good customer service if it translates into um, the best possible work quality. You know, if, if you actually think that that's true, then you're, you've got the wrong mindset when you're hiring people. Now, there are some jobs where that's absolutely important, you know, like, and I would say it's mostly jobs that don't deal with people. Um, you know, service industries that, that deal with people like you, sh- you, you really have to change your thinking. But when you do the hiring, it's, it's easy to go, Hey, look, I've been through college. I know what that's like. I know the, de- the determination, the sacrifices that people make. I want that kind of a thing. So if they haven't been to school, then clearly they're just, they just don't know what it's like and they're not going to really make it here. You know, I, I get the temptation to think like you've got to hire somebody that's already done this job somewhere else and done it so well that they're going to, well, then why are they here at your door, by the way, if they've done that job and they've done it so well somewhere else? And would you want somebody that's just going horizontal, you know, that's already done that, that's not going to be pushed to grow, to experience new things, et cetera, that you're, you're setting that person up for a career mediocrity. So the problem is the value that we place. We place value on, on the resume so, and I'll just use the resume to sum up things like past work experience and educational experience and so forth. We place value on the resume in so much so that we think that the better that resume is, remember all of the collected experiences and education and everything that we think is important, that the, 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 the more extensive and valuable that resume is, the better worker that person is. And that's not, that's almost never true. And so if, if you ever have an opportunity to deal with people and your business deals with people, um, let's be clear with each other that your clients, your, your patients, your customers, they don't necessarily care at all about where you went to school. Yeah. They don't care really in most cases how long you've been doing what you're doing. You know what they really care about? You can hate me all day long, but I'm going to say it. They care whether or not you can make them feel heard. They care whether or not their experience at your business is a positive one. They care whether or not they get the help they're coming to you for or the product or service they're coming to you for. They care about their perception of how all of that unfolds. So if you think that hiring the resume provides that kind of an experience, nine out of ten times you're probably wrong. you got to hire the person that provides that kind of experience and in a in an ideal world that person also has a good resume but but look for the character first and the person first in other words you have to place value on the experience you're creating for your clients customers patients whatever you you got you don't place value on the resume thinking that that's going to inherently create the the experience that you're looking for because it most of the time won't you have to you have to place the value on the experience that you're selling. You're selling an experience. You could be a doctor. You're selling an experience. You could be a lawyer. You're selling an experience. You could be a tire salesman or at work at a tire shop. You're selling an experience. It doesn't really matter. What you're selling is an experience. People are buying your product or service because they might need it and it's going to help them and so forth. But it's the experience that's going to make them come back. And so you have to focus as an employer or as a leader in your company um, even if you're the employee, focus your efforts on the experience that's that's taking place, not on the product or service per se. I mean, obviously you can't just ignore all that stuff, but make sure the priority is on the experience, and you'll completely flip everything about what you're doing, and and you'll you'll start to see people that are better at things 
than other people and you can start moving them around inside the organization or getting rid of them altogether and then you can start bringing in the right kind of people and you'll you'll surprise yourself that the resume might be less important at this point and there's lots of movies on this topic right? I think Jennifer Lopez just had one called Second Act but um, there's, there's a bunch about yeah. how it's not about the experience I mean it's about I'm excuse me it it's is not about a, the it's not about the resume it's yeah. about the experience yeah. that you're creating and, and does that person have it yep You've I mean, done an incredible job here in in your law offices of creating that kind of experience, and and uh, it you know the growth of your your companies is is just a testament to that. And uh, at at the school that I run, one hundred percent, I've been focused on the experience right. that the students have in the classroom. And every teacher that I've hired, I've hired because of the experience that they would give the students. And and not every teacher is perfect, and so you know, like you said, sometimes you have to uh, do some changes there. But when teachers are focused on the experience that the students have, see, so students have to come back, but they come back as ready learners. They're ready to learn. They're excited to learn. They come back with a bounce in their step, with a smile on their face, and they're they're ready to to experience learning, which is one of the most exciting things for a human being to do. Yet. Most schools, the experience is such that kids drag their feet and have their heads down. Ah, oh, I gotta go to school. I hate, you know, I hate this. And and that's the experience that's been created for most students in most schools. And so, those of you that are in the education field, what experience are you creating for your students? What experience are you giving your your mm -hmm. teachers so that they can provide a similar experience for their students? Yeah, so I think of those kinds of industries where services or products are provided because they just have to be. And in, in most any circumstance where you as a customer, client, patient, whatever, feel like you have to go back. I challenge you, I, I bet you, I bet you almost every last dollar I own that those experiences are the worst ones. It, for example, how about the motor vehicle department? The MVD, man. I mean, it's a governmental agency. Who cares, though? But they're, they, they're the ones that issue the licenses. They're, they're the ones that do all of the registration and so forth. So um, you have to be there, and you have to go through that experience. And, you, and, and guess what? They don't care. You know? Um, they don't. They don't care. They just do the, the, what they have to do. They go through the steps. They're, they don't, you know, because it, it's not like you're going to go somewhere else. It's not like it's not like they can do a, a horrible job and you're going to go somewhere else. The fact of the matter is, is you have to go back. You have to be there. Well, there's a lot of places where clients, customers, and patients feel that way. I'm thinking in particular of doctors, and 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 how you get kind of sucked into the thinking like you just have to go back. I mean, they're the ones that know you. They've got the prescriptions on the ready, or you know whatever. And so, um, but that's it's not true. What what if the MVD focused on the experience that they were providing what if that was true uh, what if the post office did that what if the grocery store did that what if your doctor did that what if any organization that you feel like you typically have to be a part of started doing that and they focused on the experience not so much the actual task of issuing the driver's license or collecting the you know registration fees or whatever what if instead they focus on the experience they're providing in connection with providing the service that you needed it would be a completely different scenario. So in those in those companies, if you work for a company where you feel like the experience isn't that important because people just have to get this done anyways, um, you're wrong. Think about all the problems that you have to deal with. Think about all the frustrations that you have to deal with within that organization from all of the clients, customers, patients, whatever, and think about how much easier your job can be and all of the job of your employees can be if you focus on the experience. Because then even though they have to come back either way, they're going to come back more engaged. They're going to come back happier. They're going to come back with less stressful problems for you to have to fix if you would just up your experience game. And so I'm thinking about your school, for example. Like the kids have to go there. Yep. Well, I mean, it's they could go to a public school if they want mm -hmm. to, but that'd be a mistake. But they, it's it's not like they get a choice. Like, yeah, I'm not going to go to school today, right? Like, it's a, it's a thing that they're supposed to be at and so forth. Well, parents are an integral part of that process. If the experience is such that you get parent buy-in, you get parent involvement, parent support on an unprecedented level, as well as students who show up to be happy learners. Now you've created a culture and an experience for everybody where you're going to deal inherently with less problems from parents, less problems from students. 
See, that's why focusing on the experience is so important, even in the quote unquote have to industries, right? Absolutely. Where you have to be a part of this process. Um, you know, there's still choices as consumers, especially in the educational world. And so I choose, for example, to go to your school because of the experience I get as a parent and the experience that my kid gets. And so just think about that. I mean, but but as the employee or and, and or employer in those circumstances, it's a mistake to not focus on the experience because all you're creating is more problems for yourself. You're just creating a whole line of unhappy, grumpy, pissed off customers, clients, patients, whatever. Is that really what you want to deal with? Because you think that you 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 get them no matter what because they have to be there? I mean, even if that's true, like you're still, it's a horrible place to work. Now your culture sucks. No one's happy. Your employees aren't happy to be there. The patients, clients, you're customers. You're dealing with all kinds of turnover, all uh, kinds of customer service problems, et cetera. So, focus on the experience. Yep. And, and, and the top the top companies in the country in the world have mastered this right so you go to Disneyland and they're 100% focused on the experience that you have from the moment that you step into the park right? that's right you go to Starbucks and they're so they're just focused on the experience they're they're selling a 50 cent cup of coffee for five bucks and you're willing to pay five bucks for a cup <laughs> of coffee because of the experience of Starbucks right that's a great example yeah. because people are somewhat addicted to coffee right and they feel like they have to have their morning coffee yeah. and there's lots of choices for that and yet They'll pay five bucks at Sorry. Starbucks, right? Because of experience. You, you pay for an iPhone. You pay for an iPhone because of the experience that you have with the iPhone. You walk into an Apple store. The moment you walk into an Apple store, the whole store is designed to give you an experience. Yeah. And so these top companies, they've mastered this. Southwest is no different. They give you a certain level of experience. And, and that is driven by their focus on people. The number number one thing, <clears throat> if you know, if you were to ask Herb Kelleher in the past, you know, what is it that made the difference? Without a doubt, he'd say it's our company culture, it's our focus on people, it's what we've created with our people that's led to this success, this this uh, financial success. I think uh, the second thing that made Southwest Airlines so successful is their focus on simplicity. So, other airlines gave meals, Southwest gave peanuts. You know, other airlines, you know, printed tickets and assigned seats and Southwest as you showed up, you know, first one, first serve, right? Yep, first come, first serve. And uh, other airlines flew all over. Initially, Southwest just had their small little commuter routes. They they did regional airports, small commuter routes. Uh, and before, you know, recently they, they did a couple changes, but for so many years, they only had one kind of airplane. So with one kind of airplane, they only had one kind of parts, one kind of service technicians, one kind of pilot. It just simplified all their training, all their maintenance, because they knew that if a, if a plane was down, they had to get it back up as soon as possible. If a pilot was down, they had to get a replacement as soon as possible. And so yeah. they, had, they minimized the variables that could go wrong yeah. so that they could provide a certain experience of, of dependability, uh, being on time, of being a value, et cetera. And so just that, that focus on simplicity, on consistency, just it, it, it speaks for itself. And, and it, the, the financial boon that it was for them uh, <clears throat> really should cause you to ask yourself, am I complicating my work? Am I complicating my business? Am I so focused on innovation and, and doing things different that I have went beyond the mark and I've missed just the simple fact of what do I do? What, what, what is my reason for existence? Why do I exist? And am I doing it the very best that I can? And so those, are, those in my opinion, those are the two things that really set Southwest apart that helped them to be the most successful, certainly the most successful airline in the history of the world but also one of the most successful businesses in the history of the world. They're focused on people and they're focused on simplicity and, and doing one thing and doing it really, really well. Yeah, in the context of leading with power, those are leadership principles that we should definitely you know, absorb, right? So lead, leading with power is leading with simplicity, right? I love it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah those, those are some great, really great examples. Another thing that really strikes me too, when we're talking about leading with power is um, the humility that it takes to know where you suck, right? 
Um, one of the thoughts that we had mentioned before, and maybe in private conversation, is is how broken is is the new strong. You know this this facade and inauthentic um, approach to making life feel like you're you know unstoppable and unbreakable, and you know social media is a great example of how people puff everything up and only put the positive out there and and basically fake their 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 whole life right with even doctored pictures nowadays too, you know, and all that kind of crap. And, and um, all the apps that you can install on your phone is amazing to be able to change the way things actually look so that when you post the picture, it looks like it's some fantasy land, you know, or whatnot. But, but the humility to understand that you've got weaknesses and to accept them and then, and then not, not to tolerate them, by the way, just to accept and acknowledge is different than to allow to exist. Um, and that's a huge principle I think a lot of people need to understand the difference in. So the humility to acknowledge and accept weakness in your person, in your leadership style, and, uh, and the desire and the unwillingness, you know, to allow that to just exist. <clears throat> you know, you don't tolerate that crap. You get it out. Yeah. Um, I, you know, you, I love what you're sharing here. And... And this morning, as we started our podcast, uh, you said you're okay. And you could have been inauthentic, and you said, this is the greatest day of my life. And uh, not that we want to, uh, you know, spread our garbage out and and take our dump truck and dump it on people and say, you know, woe is me, you don't want to walk around like Eeyore, and oh, this is, you know, life sucks. Because nobody, <laughs> nobody likes to be around a downer. Um, but also, you'll find that if, you know, the more that you're around somebody, you can sense when they're giving you canned answers. You can sense when they're giving you inauthentic answers. If every day you see somebody, they tell you it's the greatest day of my life. If every day you see somebody, they say, oh, great, I've never been better. Huh. You know, when you're, when you're awake to that, maybe the first or second or third time that you're with them, like man this guy's so positive this girl's so positive it's it's awesome to be around but when you hear that over and over then you start to question the authenticity of everything else that they say and everything else that you experience with them and so um, you know, to be real to be humble to recognize when you uh, are in need it's actually giving somebody the opportunity to serve you so if you would have said I'm great then you know, in my mind, he's great. He doesn't need anything. And when you say, you know, I'm okay, immediately in my mind, the thought that came to me is, what can I do for Ben today? What can I do to serve him? What can I do to help him? What can I do to make a difference? Now you've given me an opportunity to serve you and to make a difference. And that's part of this humility, this servant leadership, uh, where you're now giving other people the opportunity to become servant leaders and raise their level of service to you, to the organization, and to the world thank you yeah so so broken is the new strong is something that um you know i've jotted down in my notes in the past uh just a principle i'm still wrapping my head around but essentially it's it is the it's the leadership humility to acknowledge that there's weakness in your life it's by no means the excuse to allow that weakness to 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 continue to exist though you know there's a difference between the guy who sits on the couch lazy as a freaking you know sack of potatoes his whole entire life mooching off the government and not everything else right never refuses to get a job even though he's completely fine keeps looking for disability even though he doesn't need it that kind of thing right and let's be honest there's people out there that are that way so you know if he sat there on the couch and says yeah i suck i'm lazy uh, but doesn't take any steps to do anything about it you know, that's not what I'm talking about. Yeah. Bro broken is the new strong does not encompass that. What it what it means is is the is to stop being fake. Be authentic. Look yourself in the mirror. Acknowledge, for example, if you if you've got a weight problem, look yourself in the mirror and go, Wow, I'm fat. And then and then go do something about it, right? Hold yourself accountable to that and then go go fix it. Don't lie to yourself and say, I'm I look amazing when you when you don't feel that way. If you feel that you look amazing, great. But if you don't really feel that way, don't lie to yourself. This isn't some pumped up, half-assed positivity speech that you give yourself trying to make yourself feel better. Broken is the new strong means that you acknowledge what's really wrong and then you do something about it. There's the strength. The strength is having the humility to acknowledge it and the strength is having having the the desire and the fortitude to do something yeah. about it, right? And so there's if I'm dealing with a person as an employer and, and they're an employee of mine, um, I, I don't want fake. 
I don't want somebody telling me that everything's fine. If there's something wrong with one of the cases we're working on or there's something wrong in their life or something like that, um, I don't necessarily want to know about the drama of what's going on in their life, but I want to know what the issues are, particularly in the cases as it pertains to work, and I want to know what their plan is to fix it. I don't want to be told that everything's fine. I want to, be, I want to, I want to know what's going on and know how to fix it. And that applies to your personal character as a leader as well and as a person. Um, broken is the new strong means, yeah, there's some things that I suck at, but here's what I'm doing about it. I'll take that guy all day long. Yeah. All day long. Navy SEALs are a perfect example. Um, they have a 80% attrition rate. There's only a 20% pass rate when you become a Navy SEAL from, from the entire, you know, BUDS is a six-month program, right? And so um, there's usually 100-something people that class up, and usually about 20-something of them make it. That's it. And those guys that make it are the ones that acknowledge that it hurts. It sucks. They've got problems, but they're gonna. But this is what I'm gonna do about it, kind of a thing. Everyone else, oh yeah, I'm great, man. This is no big deal. And inside, they're like, I can't believe I'm. I don't know if I'm gonna make it. I can't stay here one more day, kind of thing. No, no, no. Those guys never make it. Yeah. Broken is the new strong. It's their strength in acknowledging that you've got an issue, and their strength in doing something about it. Yeah. Uh, one of our uh, athletic coaches, he has a phrase uh, that he's used with our wrestlers, with our football team. Embrace the grind. Oh yeah. Embrace the grind. Embrace the suck. Embrace the challenge. Embrace. You know, it. It, it is. Uh, life is challenging, and and there's hard things, and and uh, you got to embrace that. Belief is the other one that I will just touch on today. Um, I was really struck with this recently when I was uh, listening to David Goggins' new book called "Can't Hurt Me." Um, most people know David Goggins if they're if they're an endurance athlete because he's probably one of the world's best endurance athletes. He's broken records for the most pull-ups in 24 hours to long distance races like Badwater and you know things like that. Um, David Goggins though uh, is a Navy SEAL as well, and uh, he grew up in an abusive household. Like he was beat to a bloody pulp all the time by his dad. Finally, his mom and him just ran away, and they split, and he made a life for himself. As a black guy, he was the uh, only, um, you know, he he calls himself, you know, one of the only ones in almost every circumstance he was in growing up, right? Like he was, uh, he was uh, always persecuted. They painted people in high school, painted nigger on his car and we're going to kill you, that kind of stuff, like with spray paint. I mean, like he grew up in just an absolutely horrible environment. Genetically, he had some issues with his heart, a little hole in his heart, which you're familiar with. He had a congenital defect. Um, by the time he's an adult, it was the size of a poker chip, and he's still running these ultra marathons with, you know, defib, whatever going on, and, you know, heart rhythms up to 200 beats per minute, like, you know, and he can't get under control, that kind of stuff. And, anyways, one of the reasons I love uh, this concept of belief, as Goggins kind of puts it, is um, when you, as a leader, as a person, remember, we think everybody's a leader. You're a leader, and, and if you're not a good one, then become one. You know, these mm-hmm. are the principles that will help. So you lead your life, and you lead those people around you. Um, one of the reasons, one of the things I really love about this concept or principle of belief is when you doubt what you're doing, you doubt yourself, you have doubt in anything like that, you know, anything along those lines, um, then your ability to achieve uh, feels and becomes impossible. Okay, when you have belief and you rid yourself of that doubt, the impossible becomes the inevitable. And there's the power. All right. So ridding yourself of your doubt makes the impossible the inevitable. And now who doesn't want that? Think about those big dreams that you've got, like big ones. And whatever they are, make them bigger, by the way. That's a different topic. But Dream big. Think about your goals, what you want. What if it's the kind of job? What if it's what if it's you actually want to make, you know, two, three million a year? I don't know. Whatever it is. Think about what it is that you really want to do and be honest with yourself in the mirror and recognize how impossible you think it is. And you're not and you've never been that honest. You've finally been honest enough to admit that you want something like that. Great, good for you. Step one. Now be real with yourself. Look yourself in the mirror and identify how impossible you think that is guaranteed you're going to go oh this is impossible (laughs) in your mind somewhere you're going to think i can't do that or i'm never going to actually make it there's not enough time or how i don't even know how to make that kind of money or whatever it is whatever your dream is maybe it's an athletic event whatever 
be honest with yourself and, and start figuring out how impossible you actually think that is. Start recognizing, confronting the fact that you've got doubt. Then we'll take steps together to eliminate that doubt. <clears throat> In so doing, just imagine what it would feel like to not think that that's impossible anymore, to think that it's inevitable. Like it's inevitable today that I'm going to go eat lunch sometime today. I'm eating lunch because I'm hungry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I know that's a cheese ball example on inevitability. But what if you felt like making two to three million dollars a year was inevitable? What if you got to the point in your mind, this is where you dominate your mind. You're the master of your own mind and you got to be. Everything happens in the mind. Every battle that you can possibly win has to be won in the mind first. So let's think about you fortifying and callousing your mind to the point where your impossibilities feel like inevitabilities. It's awesome. Now the principle that underlies all of that is belief. Yeah. So believe, believe in yourself and believe that you can do it and rid yourself of the doubt. Um, drown out the haters out there. They could be blood relatives of yours. They could be spouses. They could be best friends. They could be all kinds of people that are going to express doubt in you. Tune them out, drown them out, cut them out if necessary, whatever it needs to be, um, and start being in touch with you and your your own, you know, potential and, and your own, you know, you got to, you, you're you and there's only one of you. Start there if you need to. There's you and there's only one of you. One of the other principles about this is it's uncomfortable. Yeah. To achieve, to lead, to be great, to be epic is uncomfortable. Think about a little tiny seed. You think busting through the hard shell of that seed and up through the ground is easy? You think it's wonderful? No, man, that sucks. It's difficult. It's hard. It's But it's life-changing. It's transforming. It's all of the great things. It's beautiful. It's magical to really understand and see that, right? Well, that little seed it went through hell first before it mm -hmm. busted out of its own shell and busted through the ground, right? Well, that's what you're doing. So, And there's only one of you. Start with that. There's yeah. you and just one of you, and you can do it. So I love that power of belief where impossibilities become inevitabilities yeah your greatest opportunities <clears throat> your greatest gifts your greatest skills your uh, you know your greatest creations likely lie behind the door that you fear going through the most and you're gonna have some doubts and you're gonna have some fears that are going to be in the way that are gonna cause you to say oh, I don't know if I can do that you know that just seems too hard I'm not sure and those are the doors that you need to go through those are the doors that you need to take action and and put your belief into action go through those doors because behind those doors lie your greatest opportunities yeah and doubt's one of those things where you know people say the only limits that exist are the ones that you put on yourselves 100 percent agree with that well doubt is one of those biggest limits that we put and we don't even sometimes recognize that we're doing it and failure is the other one we'll fail way more times than we succeed and yet we think that if we fail that that's it Really, that's just a stepping stone, one step closer to actually succeeding. How many times have you tried to do something just truly epic and you messed it up and then went back for another bite of the apple? Most people don't, but that's where that's where you're going to be epic right there is rid yourself of the doubt. Don't worry about failure. Failure is one thing, just one more thing you can learn from to help you actually succeed. You dissect your failure, you'll find out where things went wrong and what you can do better. And then you go again and you keep going until you get it. End of story. It's, you're busting out of your own shell and busting through the ground like a seed, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's 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 uncomfortable, um, but epic. And so when you're leading with power, just think about those principles. You know, Broken is New Strong, the whole leadership thing through Southwest Airlines and the culture that they create and the humility that they lead with. And then, of course, you know, belief. Yeah, busting through the ground, man. I love, love it. it. Yeah. <laughs> Courtesy of David Goggins. That's one of his thoughts in his book, by the way. There you go. All right. Hey, great, uh, great to be with you today. Love sharing these principles. These are principles that can apply to every single one of us in every one of our situations. You don't have to be the CEO of Southwest Airlines to apply these principles of, of culture, these principles of focus and simplicity, of, of belief. And, and uh, these are things that can help you in your family. They can help you if you're uh, just an entry-level employee to really make a difference and to demonstrate leadership in whatever you're doing. Yeah, we love to hear from you, by the way. It's one of our favorite things is all the different emails and comments. So we appreciate that. Keep that coming. And we're and don't forget, we're here for you. Like this, one of the things that we love most is being a part of your lives. Um, coaching and uh, mentoring is one of the things that we love. So reach out to us. We're here. Let's hear your story. All right. Have a great day. See ya.
Thanks for listening to the Principles of Epic Growth Podcast, your path to epic performance and life with incredible growth. 